Welcome to episode 185 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Joe Navarro, who served in the FBI for 25 years. During his bureau career, he worked as an agent and supervisor in the areas of counterintelligence and counterterrorism. In this episode, he reviews the Rod Ramsey case, where a Army vet living in Tampa, Florida, was investigated, charged, and convicted of committing espionage while stationed in Germany. Joe wrote about the case in his book, Three Minutes to Doomsday, An Agent, a Traitor, and the Worst Espionage Breach in U.S. History. Through his work on this case and others, Joe Navarro was able to study, refine, and apply the science of nonverbal communications. Joe is now recognized as one of the world's foremost authorities on reading body language and nonverbal communications. He has been interviewed on the Today Show, Good Morning America, CBS's Early Show, the BBC, and for publications such as the Washington Post and Psychology Today. You can find more about Joe on his website, jnforensics.com. But before we get to the interview, I want to let you know that I'll be sending out my November Reader Team email on November 1st. I write about NaNoWriMo, and if you don't know what that is, then you need to make sure you get my email. I will be revealing the premise of the next crime novel in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series and asking you for help deciding on the title and the cover. So please vote and I'll let you know in the December email how successful I was with NaNoWriMo. Did I reach 50,000 words? And I'll also let you know the title and which cover you chose. Also in my email, I review the movie The Inside Man Most Wanted for FBI policy and procedure accuracy. If my reader team email is not in your inbox by the end of the day on Friday, November 1st, You know what to do. Check your spam filter. Once a month, I send out my email digest and try to keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. There's a link to join my reader team in your podcast app's description of this episode. The audiobook, ebook, paperback, and hardback for FBI myths and misconceptions are available wherever books are sold. You can find an easy link to some of the retailers in your podcast app. If you've already picked up a copy of FBI myths and misconceptions, thank you. Please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I am excited to welcome Joe Navarro. Hey, Joe, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. This is fantastic because you know this podcast is called FBI Retired Case File Review, but most people know you from your expertise in body language and nonverbal cues. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, you know, I can do that interview and I've know I know that you've done, you know, many interviews on the topic. Mm-hmm. And when I went to your website, I was so excited because you actually have a true crime book about one of your, I take it, one of your most famous cases. The book is called Three Minutes to Doomsday, An Agent, a Traitor, and the Worst Espionage Breach in U.S. History. Yeah. Just listening to you uh, say that, Jerry, it, it takes me back. And uh, by the way, it's it's really an honor to be on your, your show because I, I love what you're doing to uh, to catalog the history of, uh, of a really a wonderful uh, organization. Well, as you might know, you know, I was the uh, FBI media coordinator and spokesperson in Philadelphia for the last five years of my career. And I think I just drank the Kool-Aid and <laughs> and protecting and promoting the FBI's image has just been yeah. something that I've been doing. It's, it's been almost four years. I started this podcast in January of 2016. 
Wow. And so, you know, I'm always reaching out, trying to capture those stories yeah. that uh, we need to record. And as I was mentioning to you before we started uh, recording, yeah. I've been able to interview the case agents for the Rick Ames case. I've interviewed the, you know, the case agents that were involved in uh, investigating Hanson and mm-hmm. John Walker. Yeah, and wow. this spy that you investigated, mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people know about yeah. him and his, and his associate. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and there's a lot of reasons, uh, I, I, I think, for it. N- number one, uh, we have to look at the time period. Uh, the case, which originally was investigated by U.S. Army Intelligence, uh, and Security Command, in, uh, INSCOM, they, uh, I have to say, they did a heroic, and there's no other word to describe it, Gary Pepper, Colonel, um, um, I forget the, the colonel's names, my, my apologies, but the colonel in charge there in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, they brought this case to a finite point where they were able to look at over 10,000 soldiers, which is remarkable, and reduce it to a handful of individuals that they then focused on, which eventually led to the arrest of Clyde Lee Conrad, who was in Germany, a retired army sergeant, retired on the economy in Germany, uh, served there with the 8th ID. And so I think that's why it didn't get a lot of press when, when he was arrested. What nobody knew was that there were other people involved and uh, by accident, that's how I got involved. And Tampa is a pretty, pretty sleepy place. It was in 1988 when, um, you know, the Army reached out to the Bureau and said, hey, one of the guys that used to work on the base is living there in Tampa, and uh, we'd like to go interview them as we're interviewing anybody that lived on the base. And that started. I'll never forget it. That uh, August started a 10-year investigation, which I thought it, this was something that we were going to do before lunch, finish by lunch, and um, that was not to be the case. So what was it that made the military suspicious about Conrad and then, of mm. course, Rodney Ramsey? Yeah. Well, we there was a defector at the time who was saying that secrets were coming out of Central Europe, uh, U.S. Army Central Europe, and eventually they were able to narrow it down to one base. The Army, uh, Colonel Harrington from uh, INSCOM and his team with Gary Pepper and others were able to introduce an undercover Army asset who was fairly much able to assess that Clyde Lee Conrad had been uh, spying for uh, the um, Soviet bloc, but um, the the case had to uh, take place in Europe, and eventually the the Germans uh, felt that they had enough evidence to prosecute under their statutes. And so he was arrested in Germany. He could not be extradited to the United States. This did not make a big splash. But when we, what, so the very next day, uh, the army in the United States, we went out and did all these interviews. Now, this was supposed to be a very uh, and in fact, it was a very soft interview. It was just a uh, meet and greet and just to determine if he knew anything and, and so forth. But what happened during the interview was that, and, and as you know, Jerry, the, the first 20 minutes or so, we, we spend the time just getting to know each other, very low key, nothing really important is discussed. But the minute that I mentioned the name um, Clyde Lee Conrad, uh, Roderick Ramsey's cigarette began to shake in his hand. And uh, it just happened. I, w- I was just fortunate that uh, the officer, the army officer, Al Eways, was busy writing his notes. And I just, by accident, happened to be the one in the passive role and was able to observe the shaking cigarette. So... Knowing what I know about body language, I decided to test him 
three more times spaced uh, in between with other material. And then every time I mentioned Clyde Lee Conrad, that cigarette shook in his hand over a two-hour period. Well, let me stop you there because I, I take it that's an important part of using body language and nonverbal clues. It's not just mm-hmm. seeing something one time, but right. actually to, to validate it. Exactly. You have to, to be scientific, you have to validate it. And so by validating it three times, you know, we would talk about other things and then we would come back to it. it this let me know, because as you know, well, you know, you were you were dealing with the media in the, those last five years, so you know, not all words have the same weight. And for someone who has guilty knowledge, um, that the weight of that knowledge, or in this case, the weight of a name, Clyde Lee Conrad, to someone who's culpable, was significant. So it caused what we call a limbic reaction, which is what we see in, on a polygraph examination, the vibrating needle. Well, in this case, it was the vibrating cigarette. And uh, so at the end of the interview, you know, um, we, we said uh, goodbye and um, the army had to leave. They had other interviews to do, but uh, I approached my supervisor at the time and it's kind of funny now, but I said, um, to, to Jay Kerner, who many of your listeners will, will know, I said, Jay, I'd like to open up a, a full investigation on, on Rod Ramsey. And he looked at me and, 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 he, and he said, based on what? And I, I said, a, a shaking cigarette. And he, he just looked at me and he said, Joe, how am I going to explain that to a congressional committee? <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. But let, let me ask you another question before you yeah. move on. Mm-hmm. Now, later on, you know, you, yeah. you joined a, a, a unit or a program to, yeah. to study this stuff. But at this time, what you had been in the Bureau for about 12 years, is that right? Correct. At that point, I'd been in the Bureau for 12 years, but I had been studying okay. uh, nonverbals on my own since uh, 1971. So at that point, I, I had, uh, by then I, I had already downed about uh, almost a thousand books dealing with anthropology, sociology, and, uh, and human behavior. Yeah. All right. So you were already developing this expertise on mm-hmm. your own before you officially entered that program. Yeah, and um, and it was just one of those things that I was really interested in because at the time, you know, in the 70s and even in the 80s, there's there was no university in the United States that covered nonverbal communications because, because nonverbals or body language is covered both by psychology, anthropology, sociology, ethnology, um, history and uh, semiotica and all sorts of things. So nobody really owns it. So I just decided to study it on my own. And then in 1990, a unit was created. And what's interesting is at the time it was classified. And the reason that the unit was classified, and people have asked me over and over, well, what, <laughs> what use was this unit if it was classified? It, it was the behavioral analysis program and it was classified because we at the time knew that we possibly had a mole within the bureau. And so six agents who were selected from the 12,000 agents available at the time, this, this program you could not uh, volunteer for. You were, you were picked. Six of us uh, were picked. And in fact, one of the first cases that we had was um, had to deal with the issue of, uh, of uh, individuals in the FBI who were uh, working for uh, the Soviets or the Russians. Wow, that's fascinating. So mm-hmm. uh, uh, these are suspected people. Nobody knew who they were, but they felt that there were people who were, uh, who were doing that. Yeah, we had uh, we had information from sources, uh, both uh, from human sources and technical sources, that pinpointed to certain behavioral characteristics. And so the R unit was responsible for trying to figure out who possibly could it be. And then once we knew 
who they were, how do we get in their heads? Because these are individuals who are already working as counterintelligence agents. So they would know how to behave. They would know what tactics would be used against them. So one of the reasons that I was brought on board was because of my experience both with with nonverbals and uh, with interviewing. And, and I must say, the other aspect of the um, unit, um, which was the greater aspect of it, was to assist field offices uh, throughout the Bureau, who, which had major cases, but who had little experience with, uh, with behavioral type things. And so what, what the criminal unit was doing in, at the bottom of the Jefferson building in, uh, in Quantico at the academy, we were doing on the counterintelligence side in the uh, behavioral analysis program. And I, I would bet 90% of the agents that are out there had never even, or still have never heard of the behavioral analysis program. And, um, and it was running for well over 15 years. Well, you're right about that. I spent the majority of my career working economic crime, you know, Ponzi schemes and mm -hmm. advance fee schemes. And so I was dealing with con men. So I could have definitely used <laughs> some of those skills. <laughs> well, that, but, but, you know, from, from your own work, Jerry, then, you know, these individuals are very sharp. They're very facile. They can be they they can be quick to pivot, and so it it requires a certain expertise to 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 deal with that kind of of individual who, in in many instances, uh, especially in Ponzi schemes, we we see psychopathy because uh, their willingness to to do great harm, um, and they don't seem to be bothered by it. I'm sure you've interviewed them, and and they like they don't care, right? Oh, absolutely. And it was always fun for me because I think, you know, as a black female special agent, they were kind of surprised when I walked into the room and they discovered that I was the agent that was going to investigate them. And so yeah. I think they probably underestimated me a little. And so yeah. it was kind of fun playing, playing those games. Uh, and so what you were learning to do, what you were developing was a way to use those external signs to get into people's heads. Exactly. Well, you know, part of the assessment process was what kind of personality are, are we dealing with here? As, as you know, when they're very narcissistic, they overvalue themselves. Um, and, th and so they tend to talk a lot where the more paranoid personality will be more reluctant to communicate and be more hyper suspicious and, and, and so forth. And, uh, and we certainly have seen uh, this with, uh, with some of the spies that we have arrested, uh, both at, at the agency and, uh, and, and within the Bureau. Um, so part of it was the personality assessment. And then how do we, how do we get into uh, their, their heads? And often even, for instance, um, something you just described is, well, who's the best person to elicit the information? And, uh, and one of the things that was interesting with, uh, with Roderick uh, Ramsey was one of the, when, once the interviews began, I was working this with uh, Mrs. Uh, Terry Moody, and um, he preferred to look at her and answer her. Now, she was, she was sharp as a tack, but she pretended like she didn't know anything about the Army. So I would ask these broad questions, and he would turn to her to answer. And she, I mean, she had him eating out of, uh, out of her hands. Well, we call that nowadays mansplaining. <laughs> all right, so so let's go back to the to the initiation mm. of this case. So now yeah. all you have is a, a as is a movement a movement and uh, yeah. how are you able to write the predication f to open this case? Yeah, the predicate for the case for me was a little complicated, but it was solid. Most people, including most agents, forget the Supreme Court case of Terry versus Ohio. And Terry versus Ohio, everybody sees a stop and frisk. That's not what Terry versus Ohio was really about. In Terry versus Ohio, which was decided in 67, the Supreme Court for the United States said that a trained officer 
who makes observations and can, quote, articulate those observations with particularity, can then take action, which for the normal person would not be tolerated. And so I use Terry versus Ohio as the predicate in saying that in my experience and in my training and learning, and I literally put out all, all the literature and all the training, you know, autodidactic training that I had done, that this behavior was indicative of a limbic reaction to a specific stimulus. And that stimulus was the name of an individual that no one knew had been arrested. And, and uh, so that began the, the initiation, which uh, I have to say, they, uh, Jay went out on a limb, but he did put me on a tight rein. He said, you got to have me something within 90 days. Uh, otherwise, we have to shut this down because, you know, uh, there's there's just not enough here for, for the average person. And, and fortunately, within 90 days, uh, I was, in fact, able to deliver uh, a, at least some uh, usable um, admissions. Well, let me ask you, mm-hmm. when the Army first started just kind of reaching out around the country, talking mm-hmm. to people who had been stationed at this particular arm, army post yep. where uh, Clyde Conrad was. How many people were they throwing a net out at? So the, so they were looking at um, over initially over 13,000 people oh. that had been stationed at the 8th Infantry Division in uh, Bad Kreuznach in Germany. Because you got to remember, this was a base that had a very high turnover. So a lot of soldiers were coming in, a lot of soldiers uh, were, were going out. So it was a matter of talking to as many people uh, as they could that could paint a, uh, a mosaic of, uh, of what life was like and, and what everybody's responsibilities uh, were. So that means that when you first did that initial interview, you mm-hmm. had nothing. I had nothing. Now, it's, it's been alleged later that, in fact, at, at headquarters, they had some information that, uh, that Clyde uh, Conrad and, and Rod Ramsey, um, they worked together, and so they knew a little bit more about it. But in the initial interview, uh, when I got the paperwork on it, there, there was no uh, indication of that. And, and I have to tell you, sometimes it's better that way because my approach that day, I, I think if I had been tainted by, uh, oh, we think this or that, I think it would have tainted my observations. I think I would have tried to, to, to see something that maybe wasn't there. So my eyes were wide open to anything. And, um, and to this, what, what was interesting is I saw these behaviors, but my partner never saw them. And, um, and, and that's fine. Um, so I, I, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where I just happen to be at the right place um, at, at, um, at the right time. Well, I work criminal cases and, you know, my best friend, you know, from college was an agent and she worked espionage cases. And to this mm-hmm. day, I still don't know what, what, <laughs> what she did. I know she won a big director's award, but what's so strange about, and, and of course I'm coming from the criminal side when I use the word strange is yeah. that you're making cases most of the time based on confessions you don't have like i had you know the the document or the the wire transfers or the witnesses you're talking about confession so from the very beginning of this of this Mm -hmm. investigation am i correct and all you were trying to do is to get rod ramsey to tell on himself the short answer yeah (laughs) but the the more complicated answer is this all the evidence in a spy case is usually overseas. It's in the hands, uh, in this case, of the, uh, of the first the Hungarian intelligence service, and then that went directly to the Soviet intelligence service, the then KGB. So all the evidence was over there. So it was very difficult for us 
to, as you would do, collect the evidence and, 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 and so forth. Um, so I needed to get admissions from him. And I'll, I'll give you an example of one that I got very early on, which helped to support the extra 90 days that, that I then got. He wanted to talk about uh, what life was like and so forth. So you know, I would say, well, Rod, tell me, t- tell me what it was like. Oh, you know, we would go out drinking and so forth. And, uh, and I said, uh, you know, in, in, in the way that you have to talk to the bad guys. And I said, well, w- what about women? Oh, well, he says, you know, in, in Germany, prostitution is legal. And I said, well, I didn't know that. And, uh, you know, and he would say something like, well, should Mrs. Moody be hearing this? And I, I said, I, you know, I, I think Mrs. Moody's cleared for weird, too. So go ahead. And, and he would just go on and pontificate about how much he would spend on prostitution. What he wasn't realizing was, is that he was telling us how many thousands of dollars he was spending. On an, an army salary. On an army salary of $92.36 a month. Okay. So each time he did that, you're getting closer and closer to believing and understanding that you have something here. You know, before, yeah. we, before we move on, and, and I hope we're doing this in a, in a good order, but could you give everyone an understanding of what's at stake? What was it that he and Clyde, well, you know that Clyde Conrad has already been uh, arrested, but what is it that you suspect that Rod Ramsey has also provided? What kind of damage would the yeah. information, you know, do to, to the United so, States? So that's, that is the question that makes me um, take a step and become very humble because we, we knew that Clyde had um, basically given away the go-to-war plans, Op Plans 3200, which was the general go-to-war plan for Central Europe. We knew that if the Soviets attacked, if the Soviet forces were to attack, they would at- attack through the Fulda Pass. What Clyde Conrad and, and, uh, and others uh, gave away to, to, the, to the Soviets was our go-to-war plan, the very specific plan of things like where would our soldiers be uh, uh, stationed? Where would the tanks be? Where would the uh, fuel refueling stations be? What kind of weapons would be moved into forward positions? Where would be the follow-on positions? Where would be the helicopters and the missiles and the hospitals, the field hospitals? Everything that um, you would need to go to war was there. Basically, uh, and in fact, we know this from the testimony of the generals, Clyde Conrad got to see and gave away the same documents that the theater commander, commander of, uh, of, uh, of allied forces in Europe, uh, got to see. But that wasn't the worst of it. What we didn't know until, and, and this is a good place to introduce this, we eventually got Uh, Rod Ramsey to not only make admissions, but to make a confession. And one of the things that uh, he revealed to us was that it wasn't just the plans from the 8th Infantry that were being given away, that they had so many secrets that they actually had to rent an apartment, something that was unprecedented in, uh, in espionage, that two spies had so many secrets that they actually had to have a, an apartment where they could go and photograph them. That blew the Germans away. That blew Army intelligence and the CIA. And uh, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, Jerry, but people at headquarters and Washington field office thought we were crazy, that no such thing could happen. Wow. <laughs> and so this is something that you've gotten from, from Ramsey that Mm -hmm. nobody else had and it just sounded so far-fetched that they were like oh come on we're not gonna believe that exactly they they were saying you know this guy's playing you like a fiddle nobody rents an apartment for secrets this you know and so they they said well we'll find it so um so I asked for a map, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately, um, I was sent. Well, it's okay. They can't hurt me now. 
Washington field office sends me a um, tourist map of Germany. And <laughs> I'm looking at this and I'm, I say, I, I can't use this, guys. So I reach out to some of the people that I knew in Germany and they've got me, they went to the office of, uh, that fixes the roads. You know, this is back in 88, 89. This is before Google Earth. And uh, the guy that fixes the roads has the streets photographed every year. And he sent me a, 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 a high-resolution photograph. And um, so we presented it to, to uh, Ramsey. And uh, he mo looked around, picked the place out. And uh, so we tell the Germans, and the Germans said, look, I hope this, uh, this is the, uh, the German Bundeskriminalamt, uh, the FBI equivalent. And they said, I hope he's not playing with us. So they sent a squad car or a car out with two agents. And uh, as they're driving through uh, the neighborhood, which at the time was uh, um, number four, uh, Josef uh, Schneiderstrasse, there's a man raking the leaves and he approaches the car and he says, I knew you would come. And it was the owner of the apartment that had rented it to Clyde Conrad wow. and, uh, and, uh, and Ramsey. And that's when people began to pay attention and say, what else was there? Wow. Now, as a behaviorist, mm -hmm. explain to us why Ramsey is talking to you. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Jerry. You know, um, the when I came in the FBI, I, uh, I I had been a police officer out in uh, in uh, Provo, Utah, and um, but I had an old timer, an FBI agent, um, said, you know, it's it's not about the confessions, and I was like, what? <laughs> he says, no, it's not about the confessions. It's about FaceTime. He says, if you can get a guy in front of you and keep him there with enough time, they, they will always reveal what's going on. And so with Rod, it was, as you know from the book, uh, Three Minutes to Doomsday, it was all about low pressure, about talking about any number of things. He scored the second highest score ever recorded in the U.S. Army um, IQ test and, and trying to stay up with him because one day he would wanted to talk about the Byzantine Empire and the next day he wanted to talk about, uh, you know, Plato versus Socrates versus this and that. And so you had to keep up with him. But what was interesting was then we would jump back on the subject. And people have asked me, well, what kept him coming back, knowing that you were an FBI agent, Terry was an FBI agent, and that he had his attorney's phone in his wallet the whole time, which was given to him by his, um, by his mother. And I think it was just that there was a certain amount of comfort that he found uh, in talking to us. But I also think it was part of his personality that he so overvalued himself that he thought that he could dance around us. And, um, and he did. He, he danced around us and, and made a grave. Talk a little bit about choosing female partners, because I mm -hmm. think that's an, an, a very important part of this that uh, I found fascinating. Uh, great question. You know, so, some people have said, uh, well, isn't that sexist or this or that? And, uh, you know, the way I approach cases is who is the best interviewer? One of the biggest mistakes the FBI makes is, uh, as you know, you get the ticket on the case and the assumption is that you will be the best interviewer for that. I completely disagree with that. And having, and having been in the behavioral program, I can attest to it. I, for one, am terrible with uh, interviewing certain people. They, it, it, they just get under me, and I know that I am not the one to be doing the interview. And, and, and that's just a recognition on my, on, my, on my part. But I also know that with somebody like Rod Ramsey, who had always aspired to show off, to, to be a, a, a man about town, and so forth, that I knew he would react to having a woman present. And invariably, 
whenever we had a female agent there, and I, I really lucked out with with Terry Moody. Now keep in mind because she's Terry Moody is is, is one of the the heroes on this case. She's pregnant throughout this time, and not just a little pregnant. I mean, she's working fourteen hour days, and she is way out there. But he seems to perceive her as not a threat. And like I said, he would often turn to her and in in very pedantic form, explain things to her. And we got, uh, I mean, we just got exquisite details um, that we otherwise would not have. And I think it was so it was in part creating the environment, but also picking the right people to uh, to do this. He he told me that if somebody had come at him, you know, in typical bureau, f- what he called typical bureau fashion, very strong, very stern, he would have called an attorney that day. And he, and he did. He, he always had that, uh, the attorney's uh, phone in his pocket. Wow. Now, one of the things of when, when reading this, uh, when, when yeah. reading the book, you know, I'm looking at how, you know, Terry has to handle herself. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, being called Mrs. Moody, you know, as an agent trying to conduct an investigation with my, you know, agent partner, yeah. that, t- that took a lot on her part to realize that she needed to stay in that role for the good of the case. Yeah. Like like I said, it, it was truly theater. You know, uh, Terry Moody is no one to mess with. Uh, I wouldn't want to cross her. Um, you know, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. What, uh, this is before the Bureau had credit cards, and we had to go to the bank to, to get pick up money for, uh, for the case, for surveillance, and, and it was a lot of money. I know people find it hard to believe, but there was a time when we and didn't have credit cards. And so people had to be paid in cash. And uh, Jay Kerner sends me to the, uh, to, to, to the bank and says, Terry, follow him. And then he says, whisper something to, to her. And the whole time she's walking behind me. And I said, Terry, why don't you walk next to me instead of behind me? And she says, you're an easier shot from behind. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And I don't, I don't want anybody ever to think that in any way she would not have, <laughs> you know, put, put a plug in me if, uh, I mean, she was, uh, you know, she could be as tough as woodpecker lips if she needed to. But for, for this particular case, it, she knew how important it was. I mean, imagine we had a quarter of a million troops stationed in Europe. And these clowns had placed all of our Western defenses in jeopardy. So one of the other things that happens is once Ramsey begins to cooperate with us, we also begin to sense that there was other materials. And Ramsey becomes holy on us and says, well, I don't want to give up the other people who were helping me out. And so here, to make a long story short, and, you know, people can look at the book, here's where we use nonverbals again. So we asked the Army to put together a list of, I think it was about 32 people that also had access to uh, very uh, critical information. And so Rod didn't want to tell us who else was involved. So I played this game where on three by five cards, I would write a name and I would just flash it in front of him. And I would say, I don't want to know if they've done anything. All I want you to know is tell me what their personalities were like, what games they like to play, and, uh, and how much drinking did they do. So he saw it as a non-threat. What he didn't realize and never realized was that I knew enough about the eyes and the limbic system to know that when, when we see something that can cause us harm, uh, the amygdala through the limbic system will cause the pupils to constrict and the eyes to squint slightly. And as you know from photography, the smaller the aperture, the greater the focal length. So it's more accurate. It's more precise. So on two cards, his eyes constricted, and that was Jeff Gregory and uh, Jeff Rondeau. And so with that information, 
uh, we asked the army to then open up investigations on them and to go talk to them. And the army went and talked to them. And, uh, and both of those individuals confessed. So, um, so here was a, a, another, an adjunct to the case of two other individuals, and we were able to identify them solely based on pupillary uh, constriction. And of course, I do want people to read the book because I enjoyed it so much. But if we can just give away a little bit and letting them know, when we talk about you going back and meeting with you know, mm-hmm. Ramsey and getting to know him and getting his defenses down. Yeah. Is it correct in the book that you did this 42 times? 42 times. The, what? He, yeah, I yeah. mean, 40, 42 times. And in fact, after a while, um, he was dressing like me. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was, it was kind of scary. And what does that mean? Well, in psychology, you mm-hmm. have the problem of transference and countertransference, and he began to associate with me, and so he began to dress like me and use my terms and and uh, and so forth. And it was it was scary. Did you, you pick know, anything up from him? Uh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> just no. checking. Just checking. No, no, and uh, I and this was before Purell. I I, I uh, actually washed also. No, you know, so here's one of the, you got to remember, he was living kind of wild uh, on on the streets. Um, one of the things that, um, that happened was, is uh, he was giving us so much information. And, um, and I guess, um, uh, you know, some of these interviews lasted uh, 12 hours, but the, the most frightening one has to do with the one that uh, the public uh, never really uh, knew about. And when we, I remember when, um, when we, we wrote the book um, and um, there were some people at headquarters said, well, you know, the, the Ames case and these other cases were more damaging to the United States. And uh, I said, I, I don't think you've read the full case on Roderick Ramsey. And they said, what do you, what do you mean? And I said, not only did they give away the go-to-war plans for Central Europe, not only that, they gave away all of our cryptographic material at the time to the Soviets. And so now they're starting to thinking, oh, yeah, because Rod Ramsey, instead of burning the cards that were used for coding, he was turning them over. And I don't want to describe too much of this um, on the show. You and I both know what those things look like. Mm-hmm. He was turning those over to the enemy. And they said, yeah, well, the walkers did that. And I said, there's one more thing that they gave away. And they go, well, what else is there? And I said, they gave away what's called the cookies and the pals. And the pals are the permissive action links. And those are the locking mechanisms that go on each weapon, nuclear weapon. They gave away all of that, and they gave away the nuclear go codes. And that has never happened in American history. Wow. Wow. Now, the way this case ends is so exciting. I can't believe it was never a movie because there's like a ticking bomb because you're trying to get to him to make an arrest. At the same time, the news media is sitting outside your office because they've heard about this case and this arrest. And you've yeah. got to get to him before he finds out that it's up. Yeah. So, yeah, here's another shock. There was a leak no. out of, <laughs> yeah, there was a leak out of Washington. Imagine that. Imagine that in 1989, there was a leak out of Washington. So newspapers, um, television stations are hounding us and they've actually located uh, Rod Ramsey and they are asking him, well, we've learned that you were a buddy of Clyde Lee Conrad. Conrad's in, in custody. Are you involved in any way? And so, so, you know, so now there's this race. Meanwhile, the Germans want to have a prosecution. They move a lot faster. 
And we're still interviewing Rod because now we're learning about the nuclear go codes and the National Security Agency. And of course, uh, anything that has to do with nuclear go codes, the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff are involved. So there's, you know, there's a lot of interest in this. Meanwhile, I have Rod's mother calling me every day saying, hey, a newspaper uh, just called me and said that Rod, in fact, is involved and um, is he going to be arrested? And there's so there, it's a it's like a zoo. It's an absolute zoo. And I'm clamoring to look. Can we just arrest this guy and uh, the then uh, in, in internal security section at uh, Justice Maine kept saying, no, we got to. Uh, keep getting more information. More. Why and is I, he still talking to you? Once we had an agreement in place, uh, he told me and his attorney was there that um, he actually trusted me and that he trusted that when I had said uh, initially that I had said that, look, I'm collecting this information to prosecute uh, Clyde Lee Conrad. I said, I I promise you that uh, I will not be the one to arrest you, and uh, and in fact, that's what happened. I refuse. That's kind of to... semantics, though. <laughs> oh, it's no, it's it, it, it's it's semantics. But look at the cards I was dealt. The cards I was dealt with. Someone has betrayed the nuclear go codes. Look, you can have this nation can have a thousand robberies a day and it doesn't impact a thing. You can ha we have one mass shooting every three days, but to lose the nuclear go codes? Yeah, we're talking a different level of semantics here. And, uh, and I would have used anything to secure the location of where those go codes were because he had stolen them and they were missing. Well, normally when you're the case agent, one of the rewards that you get for working so hard on the case is yeah. putting the cuffs on somebody. Yeah. So you're, you didn't do that. No, I didn't you do that. Word. It, well, it, it wasn't just that it, it was, this, this is a case of, uh, this wasn't a case of, of high five and jumping up and down. Terry Moody and I, after 42 interviews were exhausted. It, it was, it was a pathetic case. It was a pathetic case because we realized how poor security had been on that base. We realized just how uh, officers had done so little to protect these secrets because many of these secrets were stolen through just social engineering. It was pathetic in that this individual, you know, er earning $92 a month was able to compromise not only the the uh, the crypto material, but also the permissive action link. It was just it was nothing to celebrate about. And yeah, we had people in our office when the arrest was made. They were high fiving and uh, and all this stuff. And as you know from the book, Terry and I just sat there, exhausted after more than a year of doing this. Forty two interviews. I was running a fever. I was running a fever of 103 that day. I had, um, I had Epstein-Barr uh, syndrome at that moment. And all I wanted to do was go home and, uh, and get, some, uh, get some sleep. And, uh, and so I, we let other people who had worked on the case uh, take the credit for the arrest. I mean, it's just the statistics. Uh, who cares? Well, you say that, but as we know, as, a, as an FBI agent, 26 years in, statistics meant a lot. I mean, that's really what your career, you know, was um, uh, rated on or ranked yeah. on was, was statistics. But, uh, but let me ask you this one question, because mm -hmm. you, you kind of talk about it in the book on Ramsey's part. Yeah. You know, he really liked you. You were yeah. his friend. You were his buddy. Mm -hmm. I, was it possible for you to stay detached or did you have any type of emotional connection with him, for him? Did you feel sorry for him in any way at the end? Yeah. Ooh, very good question. Um, 
Uh, I did, and and um, and and as uh, as a uh, as as finally a uh, a therapist from the CIA with a top secret clearance uh, who who helped me through this um, uh, shared. She said, "If you didn't feel, then you would be what we call a psychopath, because psy- psychopathy is the ability to do things but not feel them." And she said, so it's normal to, to feel this. And, um, you know, it's not that I, it, no, I wanted him arrested. I wanted him arrested much earlier. I wanted him off the street. I actually wanted him to serve more time than he uh, eventually served. But I also saw the pathetic uh, side of him where, you know, he, he at times didn't have any money to eat. Um, he would, uh, and Terry would feel this, Mrs. Moody would feel the same way. She's bad that, you know, here he, he was an eating and, and, and so forth. So there's the human side, but, uh, the professional side, uh, no, we had to take him down and, and he's, and, you know, and for years afterwards, he would still, uh, write Christmas cards, uh, both to Mrs. Moody and myself every year from, uh, from prison. But I, I just asked the Bureau to, you know, stop forwarding them because I, I think it creates this, um, you know, this psychological uh, sort of miasma in my head. There's a dissonance of, okay, you put him away for 36 years, um, but it was through your craftiness that you did this. And this is a game that I, I really don't a, a, in, enjoy playing, and I would do it again for my country, but um, it's it's not that I would uh, highly recommend for uh, for most people. Uh, it's fascinating, it really is, and it's uh, it's such a good book. It really took me back, made me kind of nostalgic <laughs> of uh, <laughs> not working because I've never worked espionage, but just you know dealing with people in the interviews yeah. and the office politics. Oh, the, 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 the politics. Yeah. And I, I do want to say one thing because we've talked about yeah. leaks and I do want to make a point of mm-hmm. saying that in a normal case, when agents are working their cases, there are no leaks. It just seems that when cases, the bigger a case gets, the more um, uh, attention that gets, mm-hmm. there are leaks but it's usually not at the field agent level just saying no oh no it's 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 uh, the truth we were learning things from uh, the media questions that we knew could only be coming from somebody uh, at the headquarter level and to this day i don't understand w- what why would you do that why would you do that and hamper a um, a- an investigation but this was a case you know, people talk about, oh, you know, you have 42 interviews, your, F, your um, the, when we turned over to the defense was basically a confession that was 137 pages. The wow. uh, Mark Pizzo, just his jaw dropped. In fact, Greg Kehoe, the, the first assistant said, you know, usually we turn over a page, a page and a half of a confession. This is 137 pages. And, and people want to talk about, you know, you know, what I did. This was a case that was handled by a lot of people. You know, there was, there, yes, there was, uh, there was Terry Moody. There was Mark Reeser, the analyst, who had the ability to analyze things that I didn't have the time for. There was Lynn Tremaine, who initially had to put up with me to, to conduct the initial interviews. There was the absolutely brilliant, singular brilliance of the Army to identify one person out of over 13,000. And, um, and so the accolades really belong out there to a lot of people who worked very hard. This case took 10 years, 10 years from, from, from start to finish for the Army. It took them uh, something like 12 years. And we, we can make we, you know, we can laugh at some of the, the things like the leaks and, um, and, and uh, how stubborn sometimes headquarters can be. But, but, you know, I always appreciated the little person in the bureau who uh, took their time to, to work 
and uh, and work hard and diligently, and uh, and so many did so. And as you know, uh, in, in in Philadelphia, uh, I I know what a burden th- that office uh, could be, and what you guys were going through uh, at the time period you were going through. And um, so I, I always admire the, the the people that I worked with. Uh, me too. Me too. So we're going to let there, – there's so many more details that we could cover, but we're going to leave that so people have an opportunity to really enjoy the book and to experience some of the, the twists and turns that are involved, especially at the end, all of the things that happen to mm. you as you try to adjust to you know this case and at the end of the case. So we're going to leave that now. What I'd like to do is to now talk about some of those nonverbal clues that we talked about, clues, yeah. cues, and, and, yeah. and body uh, language things. Mm-hmm. And I thought what would be fun is that we've heard so many, you know, I, I have a book out called FBI Myths and Misconceptions, but it's about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. But there's so many myths and misconceptions about yeah. what you do. And so I thought it would be fun to talk about those. For instance, you know, when you're talking to somebody and they don't look you in the eye. Right. I heard (laughs) that that means that they're lying. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the answer is uh, the clinical term for that is crap. Um, Yeah. (laughs) I like like that clinical term. (laughs) Yeah. You know, there's so much junk out there. First of all, eye contact is um, is based both on culture and and personal um, taste. And there is no study, no scientific study that supports that uh, eye avoidance is related to deception. Now, is it true that sometimes when we see children who have been naughty and uh, you know they look down and so forth? Yeah, we'll see that. But most adults, we we don't uh, we don't behave that way. Um, eye avoidance, uh, for instance, you know how much eye contact is uh, is based on where we live. So in New York, you're allowed to look at each other for about 1.28 seconds, which is well studied and it's minuscule. And anything beyond that, it's like, what are you looking at? Uh, you know, why are you looking at me so much? Um, we're in the Midwest. It's, it's more, we know that in Latin America and in the Arab world, it's three to four seconds. And so the eye contact uh, varies by culture, but even cultures within culture. So for instance, uh, as a, um, you know, I grew up, uh, here in the United States, I was born in Cuba, but, uh, just as with uh, many in the African American community, uh, we were taught that when we were being uh, punished or castigated or um, being talked to by adults, that we were supposed to look down and avoid eye contact out of respect. Now, think about that and how that translates on the streets, where uh, there's often a, a African American. Uh, comes into contact with a police officer and they're being contrite. They're lowering their eyes out of respect. And the police have been erroneously uh, been taught this crap that eye avoidance is to be associated with culpability. And so in all my books, uh, and I've written 13 books now, I, I try to to talk about these fallacies uh, because they do have consequences and eye avoidance is not indicative of deception. Is there something that is? The answer is no. There's not one single behavior that we can say is associated with deception. And I have had agents go ape on me over this, but Remember this, there is, so number one, we've known since 1986 with the work of Paul Ekman, Bella DePaolo, Mark Frank, um, uh, David Matsumoto, uh, Julie Ber- uh, uh, Judy Burgoon out in Arizona, uh, all well known to me, that there is no single behavior indicative of deception. What we often see are behaviors 
that signal that the person is under stress, that there is a cognitive load, that um, it causes them anxiety. This is what caused a uh, rod cigarette to vibrate. But there is not one behavior and, uh, indicative of deception. And I remember when I went through the Utah Police Academy, there was a sergeant there. And he says, you know, if they touch their nose, they're lying. If they cover their mouth, they're lying. If they look up and to the left, they're lying. Crap, 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 crap. This is utter, absolute nonsense. If here's what's interesting, Jerry. If we if, if we have a minute, I looked at the 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 first bunch, the 129 cases of DNA exoneration. Uh, these are individuals that were exonerated. They were on death row, and uh, um, their their fluids, uh, their DNA did not match, and so forth. In all 129 cases, um, and I wrote about it in Psychology Today, every single police officer said that they could, they were absolutely uh, convinced that the suspect was lying. What's interesting is that not one of those officers could detect the truth. They could all detect lies. Wow. But not the truth. And what does that tell us? And keep in mind, in that study, which was done, I only looked at the nonverbals. Um, when they looked at it, they found that fully one fourth of the population was willing to say they did it just to stop the interview process. That's a whole other issue. But let me, but let me say this. Officers and agents are convinced that they can detect deception. That is just garbage. The only thing that you may be detecting are the behaviors, but those behaviors may be caused by the interviewing person themselves, an aggressive interviewer. Maybe this is the first time that a person sees a, a, a gun uh, up close. Um, maybe it, you have three people in the room. Maybe it's the nature of, of, of the question. So we see behaviors that speak to us of nervousness and tension and so forth. But all you can testify to in court is, is that, that I saw nervous tension that I saw this, and this led me to then conduct other things. I've testified in many cases where I've had to come in, and it just makes people look bad. And they say, well, uh, I just knew he was lying because he looked away. Show me where in the literature there is one article. There's not one article that supports that scientifically. But they say, well, you know, I, there's, here's a video where the person looked away when they lied. Well, I can show you videos of grandmothers looking away when they're telling the truth. And that's the problem is uh, we, we've convinced ourselves that, um, that we can use it to detect deception. What we can use it for is to detect that there's issues and to, to see if, if there's something there that is causing this person stress. And in my case, it was the name of uh, Clyde Lee Conrad. Wow. That's absolutely fascinating. And I do know that I, I have law enforcement officers who, you know, listen to this show. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you now that that is something that will make them want to explore that more. You know, you, you have 13 books. <laughs> So I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that's explored more, but it's absolutely yeah. fascinating. Let's do one more. And yeah. that is crossing your arms. Oh, how, ma how many times, Jerry, have you heard somebody say, oh, don't cross your arms because they think that you're blocking them away? You've yes. heard that. Yes. Oh, I have absolutely heard that. So, but then, so, but yeah. then I've also heard, and, and this, of course, I got from your YouTube video that I, I was watching, that yeah. that's a power move to show that I am strong and I am in power. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. What, which one is it? So which one is it? Well, uh, like many things, context is, um, is useful. Psychology Today approached me on this, and uh, they said, would you write an article for us and, uh, on the subject? Because we get a lot of questions about it. I would say that most of the time, we cross our arms um, because it's self-soothing. It's, it's a self-hug. 
So um, we're sitting watching a movie. We're talking to a good friend. We are a little nervous uh, about uh, whatever, and uh, and we cross our arms. Watch how often women, when they go to the bathroom on an airplane, um, and somebody's in the lavatory, they will immediately cross their arms and and across uh, their belly. It's self comforting. It's, it's, it's not to put people away. It's not to look bigger. It's not to look more powerful. And I would say more than 90% of the time, it's just a comforting behavior. Now, do people do it uh, when they're arguing? Yeah. And so it's self-restraining, but it's also self-comforting. Do they do it when they want to make themselves bigger? Yeah. But you have to put it in context. What else is going on? So you cannot just give it a blanket uh, check and say it's, it's for this and for that. Most of the time, it's just a self-comforting uh, behavior. And in fact, I just caught myself as I'm talking to you. I'm giving myself a self hug. So there you are. So was so was I. <laughs> As you were talking, I noted that I had my arms crossed. That, yeah, this is all fascinating. Go. So I guess the bottom yeah. line is get your book. But the other bottom line is is yeah. that whenever there is a nonverbal clue, you've mm-hmm. got to look at the content. You know the context. What's context. going on at the at at the same time context and use it as an opportunity. You know, you're talking to somebody and you see that they're biting their lip a little bit. What a great opportunity to, to, to say, you know, well, how was your day? Well, you know, my kid uh, broke the lamp or did this. Oh, so that explains the lip biting and so forth. We reveal uh, things that bother us non-verbally. And I tell people, I look for comfort and discomfort. And if I see discomfort, it's my opportunity to, can I make things better for you? Maybe I need to take a step a little bit further away, change the subject, or uh, be empathetic and ask, uh, is everything all right? Uh, I don't sit there and break down everybody's behavior, even though I can uh, in, in minute detail. But if we just use it to, to better communicate and to just look for comfort and discomfort, it, it just goes a long way. And, and even in, in, uh, in an investigative uh, setting, it's useful to, to start that interview, create comfort, and then see, well, what are the words that create discomfort? I mean, if I ask you, where were you last night? And that creates a lot of anxiety. There's got to be an explanation. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right. So we, I I just want to go through just some of the standard questions that I like to ask all of my guests because people are, there are a number of people who listen, who are also interested in becoming agents one day. And Mm -hmm. so I I like to ask the question, when you join the FBI and why you join the FBI? Um, you know, I appreciate that question. I knew you were going to ask it because I've listened to some of your other programs. Um, as far as I know, I was, I, the only way I can answer that is truthfully. The FBI approached me when I was 22, uh, approaching 23, and um, they called me up. And uh, the next day, two guys showed up with a packet. And they said, fill it out when I was 23 years old. And I have no idea uh, why other than um, I know that at Brigham Young University, both uh, at the time the CIA and the uh, FBI did a lot of uh, recruiting. I don't know if they do that anymore, but I never applied. They, uh, they actually handed me the packet. And why, why did you fill it out? Um, because I was graduating and uh, my family was poor. Uh, we uh, were refugees from Cuba. We had very little money. And um, I uh, had gone to Brigham Young University to play football. But uh, my senior year in high school, I was uh, stabbed while um, preventing a robbery. And uh, so I couldn't play and um, I had no more money. And so I. Uh, would have ac- accepted if Jerry, if you had a- asked me to work for you, I would have worked for you. 
<laughs> well, you know, we have a similar story. We, we, we do have a similar story. Nobody came to, to, um, you know, asked me to fill out the application. But when I called into the office, I was really recruited and it took only six months. I, I filled out the application in March and I was at the academy in September. And wow. I can, but I can tell you that it took me a number of years to find out my why of mm -hmm. why I was there. And to really, it took me four years before I really started to find my way and flourish mm -hmm. you know, as an agent. And I think it was because I didn't have that why before I became, uh, before I, I, I started uh, applying for the FBI. Did you find that out for yourself or no? Immediately you were, you were good, you had a mission. No, well, no, I didn't know I had a mission. In fact, uh, when I was stationed in my first office in Yuma, Arizona, I actually, because I had, uh, at first I wanted to go into medicine, um, and then later I, I already had a pilot's license, so I, th I thought about maybe just flying for the Coast Guard. And, uh, and I thought, um, yeah, I'm not sure this, this is going to be a uh, career, but it, it wasn't until I was transferred to New York and I started working uh, counterintelligence uh, that I really got into it. But let me say, I was very grateful. I mean, I, I, I'm grateful to this nation that took me in as a refugee. I know refugees are now a, a, a dirty word, but um, I came as a refugee child with nothing to offer, and I'm grateful to a nation that both uh, allowed me and my parents to come in, but also allowed me to uh, to work for a, a fantastic organization, which I I, I have always uh, treasured. Yeah, and we can see that you know from the work that you ended up doing in the FBI and post FBI. So you know this is where I normally say, so what are you doing now? <laughs> And as a person who has, you know, checked out your website, I know the answer to that. So uh, how, how can you say that in a, in a quick overview? Well, as a low achiever, uh, <laughs> I'm working on my next book. In fact, I turned in the manuscript for it uh, literally last night. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, have the next book uh, published with HarperCollins. I, uh, it's been turned over to them uh, uh, yesterday. And so this will be my 14th book. And then I think I'm going to take a break and uh, do some travel, do some teaching. And then if I get in another idea, uh, maybe another book, and then um, maybe at some future point, you and I can sit down and, uh, and talk again. Oh, I would like that. Definitely. This has been a fascinating interview. You know, I, I wasn't sure you know, how this was going to go because, you know, normally, you know, you're, you're, you're talking exclusively you know, about uh, nonverbal clues and, and behaviors. And I thought, right. oh, I don't want to do the same thing. I want to, I want to <laughs> stick to my brand, but this has been absolutely fantastic. And I will make sure that I put a link to this book uh, in the episode show notes. And of course, a link to your, your, your website for everyone to check out uh, because I, I really think this is fascinating and there's so much for just the general public to learn about what you teach, but also, of course, you know, law enforcement officers to to really get an understanding that a lot of that stuff, you know, that, yeah. that we that we learn, that stuff, and that I, yeah. yeah, and and the stuff that I even thought, you know, so much of it I thought was true, you know, yeah. is as you said, crap. Yeah, that's so, the clinical term. There you go. There yeah. you go. Keep doing what you're doing because you're making a permanent record of, of some great uh, individuals and uh, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. It's definitely become a mission. My husband keeps saying, didn't you retire? <laughs> <laughs> now, what is this FBI stuff? Because, it's, you know, it's FBI every day. Uh, and yeah. uh, um, oh, well, I'm, I'm earning my uh, pension because I was in the uh, CSRS, so I'm very happy to, to, <laughs> to get that nice pension from the FBI, and I'm still uh -huh. earning it. So this is the point of the episode where I give my guest the last word. And so I'd love for you to give us some words of wisdom because there's just mm. so much hostility and yeah. nastiness and when it comes yeah. to verbal clues, you know, you don't have to be, 
<laughs> you don't have to be a psychologist to understand what people are saying to you. So what would you like to my, say? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I guess my word of wisdom would be this. You know, the uh, Carl Sagan, I think, said it best. Um, he was both smart enough to ask the question of the ages and to answer it. And, and, and he said it like this, all we are is the sum total of our influence on others. That's all we are. And, uh, and I think sometimes we have to take a step back and say, it's not what we earned. It's not how much we can yell. It's the sum total of our influence on others. And I, and I hope everybody thinks about what, what is their influence, because that's all we are. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Joe Navarro, Rod Ramsey, and of Mrs. Moody. There are also links to articles about the case and a YouTube video of Joe providing more information about body language. And of course, I'll have links to two of his books, Three Minutes to Doomsday, An Agent, a Traitor, and the Worst Espionage Breach in U.S. History, and What Everybody Knows, an Ex-FBI Agent's Guide to Speed Reading People. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. This podcast is about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, I want to invite you to join my reader team, where once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI, books written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. Nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You can join on my website or use the link in the description of this episode in your podcast app. I would love it if you also check out my books. My nonfiction, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And there's also my Philadelphia FBI Corruption Squad crime series. All of my books are available wherever books are sold. Thank you for listening to the very end. And I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.